Um, let's look at some of the stories on the front pages and inside the papers. Joining me to do that, Albi Amancona, political commentator and the co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism. Albi, good morning. Good morning, Rosie. Um, there's so much a debate about uh, the comments of Suella Braverman. I just wonder what your perspective was, Albi. She says immigration's a threat to the West. Does she have a point? I think the the phrase immigration is, is a threat to the West is perhaps something which has been overused since the mid 20th century when we saw, um, you know, a, a lot of migration to this country. But I do think she has made some pretty important and reasonable points in the speech that she made yesterday. I don't think it was briefed out in the most helpful way. I, I'm not sure why she, why her team felt the need to brief out the line about being gay or being a woman not being enough of a reason to become a refugee, because actually that made up a very small part of the speech, and it wasn't a particularly important part of the speech, so I don't know why it was briefed out in that way. So, so but in why, terms of but... the things which I thought were important, Rosie, just before I answer the question about why she briefed them out, the bits were important were... The, that she said she wanted reform of the ECHR and she wanted reform of the UN Refugee Convention. You know, she claimed in this speech that some 780 million people could be considered refugees and an, in, an, an international system that allows that many people to be considered refugees. Is that really something which is sustainable? And I think perhaps that is something which the international community needs to consider. Mm. Messaging is really important though, isn't it? And and why do you think they sort of sold at the speech in the way they did? I think it was a bad decision to sell the speech in the way in to sell the speech in the way that they did, because ultimately uh, that small line about uh, about if you are a woman or if you are a gay man or a woman in a country where you're suffering discrimination but not persecution, you should not be considered a refugee. It made up a very small part of the speech. And she actually also said that if you are facing persecution, then of course the West should offer people sanctuary. So ultimately, it was a storm in a teacup. I think she was trying to pitch to the Tory right, make it a bit of a cultural issue. I think it was quite silly because ultimately that is all people focused on before the speech. It's yeah. still what people are focusing on after the speech, when actually she made some perfectly reasonable points about the international refugee system not being fit for the 21st century. Yeah, and the Times leading article says, look, Miss Brownman is a polarising politician, an ambitious one too. The analysis here is, I'm quoting here, her speech is likely to be seen as a calling card to the Tory right. But despite her questionable performance at the Home Office, she sometimes says things that need saying. Who do you think she was really addressing yesterday? Ultimately, I think she was addressing international leaders. She was speaking at an, an American central right think tank um, and she was making a pitch to the international community to say, look, we need to have a conversation about the international refugee system. She did also have some red meat in that speech for the Tory membership and the Tory right, who she kind of sees as her supporters within the Conservative Party, if and when uh, Rishi Sunak is no longer the Prime Minister, no longer the leader of the Conservative Party, and the Tory party needs a new opposition leader. I think she's trying to pitch herself as that as that, as that right-wing mm. leader who could get that support from that wing of the party. What do you think, then, were sort of the most credible parts of the argument that she put forward? I think the most credible parts of the argument that she put forward was, as I mentioned before, that if the international refugee system can categorise 780 million people, almost a billion people as refugees, can we really say that this is a system which is sustainable in the 21st century when actually the pressures on migration are only, are only going to get worse because of, because of climate change, because of wars, because of other issues that, that cause people to make moves? Is that really something which mm. is sustainable? You know, when this was made in 1951, I believe, 72 years ago, I think there were about 2 million people who were considered migrants. Now, of course, the world population was much smaller then. But the point is, is something which has been unreformed since 1951 really going to sound the test of time? I think she's right to think probably not. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a bit of a question mark over her using that sort of 780 million refugees in the world. I think the UN say there'd be uh, more like 29 million, which is obviously still a lot, but significantly less than uh, 780. Uh, the point that's been picked up by The Telegraph, front page, is um, what she said about British culture, Albie, saying if cultural change is too rapid and too big, then what was already there is diluted. Eventually it will disappear. Does British culture risk disappearing if we don't control migration? Look, I think 
migration on on that sort of scale 780 million people you know we could start to see some of that happening do i think that would actually happen no i think there's probably a bit of truth in what suella is saying and a bit of truth in what the un is saying yes there might be 29 million people on the move today the UN would say that because they don't want to reform the UN Refugee Convention. So while a brave woman is using the opposite extreme to try and make her point that if we don't do something about the UN Refugee Convention and the ECHR, the numbers could get much more out of control. And what she is arguing for is more control on migration. And actually, what I think was one of the most important lines of her speech, which hasn't got any pickup at all, is she said the, the optimal number of migration is not zero. So she clearly feels that there is a number of migrants which is acceptable she thinks it's too high now she doesn't think zero she thinks zero is too low and we need to find that point which works not just for the united kingdom but also for countries around the world mm. let's move on shall we front page of the guardian um talking about what you do when pupils don't turn up at school we learned um last week that there was some research said parents sort of some parents no longer believed it was their responsibility to ensure their child was in school every day you wonder whose responsibility it is um and persistent absence when pupils miss 10 percent or more of sessions has more than doubled since before the pandemic um this latest report uh, has come out, which is what The Guardian are talking about, saying, look, only as a last resort should you fine uh, school absentees. What is the solution, Albie, if parents are saying it's not our responsibility if our children come to school? Is a fine an appropriate strategy? Personally, I think a fine is an appropriate strategy. I mean, th this report that the, the the Education Select Committee, I believe, looked into in Parliament highlighted that, that fines were uh, not as effective as they would have hoped. I think there was a top head teacher um, from a union that also agreed with that. Um, but perhaps the fines aren't being used enough. You know, ultimately, we know that there are situations where fines are very effective, um, not just at stopping behaviour, but also raising revenue to fund solutions to the problem that we're looking to solve. If we look at speed awareness causes, for example, and their impact on speeding, I do think we've got to be taking a much harder line on parents who do not who do not send their children to school every day, because ultimately it's not the parents who are suffering here. It's the children who are suffering here and the most disadvantaged children, if they're not spending time in school, their life prospects are much worse. And the chance of them, um, the chance of them rising the social mobility ladder is much lower. So I actually think maybe we actually need more use of fines okay. and maybe some sanctions on um, on benefits for those parents who are on benefits who aren't sending their children to school. I would be taking a tougher line, Rosie. Clearly, yes. Um, we'll have your say. You can text me 8722, start your message with the word times, take on Albie if you feel like it. Um, there's an interesting story inside the Times about the the tactics that the British Museum, Albie, are using to try and regain some of their lost items. Sort of over the summer, it all unraveled that it was over 2,000 pieces that someone had walked out with them. They've managed to recoup 60 of them. Um, they haven't necessarily got the most robust strategy in place for trying to find the items that have gone missing. I mean, this story just gets shocking the more I read about it. I think there are around 2,000 um, items in, 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 this, in the British Museum which hadn't actually been properly recorded. So there are no pictures, there are no descriptions, there's no proper inventory process. And you think this is meant to be the pinnacle of global museums, the pinnacle of Britain, some of the most some of the most fabulous and important artefacts in the world are stored at the British Museum. And they're not even keeping a proper inventory. And then one of their members of staff walks out with some of the most valuable items in the world, is probably selling them on the back black market, making loads of money. It's absolutely shocking. I believe George Osborne is the chairman of trustees of the British Museum. And really, I think he's going to have a lot of questions to ask and the rest of the trustees and the management about how something like this was ever allowed to happen in the first place. Yeah, a, a spokesperson said to part of the, well, you, you've laid it out there, part of the argument they've said um, for not publicising exactly what's lost, but they're saying it's these type of items that might be lost. If you can have a look and see if you've come across any of them, that's kind of the call to the public. Um, 
They've said they don't want to provide too much detail because that, I'm quoting here, risks playing into the hands of those who might act in bad faith. For example, um, you know, a specific type of jewellery. You might think, oh, right, they've realised that's missing. I'll melt it down instead. It seems, though, I'll be reading between the lines. The reality is um, they can't publish, publish the items that they've lost because they don't have the details of exactly which ones have gone. I don't even think they know which ones have gone, to be honest. If they're not able to publish exact descriptions of what's missing, how can we know that, that how can we know that something's missing? When people lose cats and we see signs for missing people, they don't just sort of leave obscure descriptions of what this person or what this cat or what this dog might look like. They have proper pictures, maybe several pictures, proper descriptions, where they last were, where they like hanging out. And then that is how the public are most most useful when it comes to locating missing people mm. and missing pets. But in this instance, where we've got missing museum artefacts. What well, we've got a couple of lines of what this might look like because they're worried about it being melt melted down. I think that's total rubbish. They just don't have the right processes in place to deal with this kind of thing. And I think it's I think it's appalling. We're going to come on to actual rubbish now. And there were extraordinary photographs yesterday in sort of the East End of London. Huge, I mean, I really mean huge piles of rubbish um, because of a strike uh, by bin men. But this is a situation now where the strike has, I think we could probably say, uh, been successful because the bin men have secured a pay rise uh, and the rubbish now will be collected. <laughs> So sometimes strikes can be effective to all of those people who are anti-strike out there. Look, I think this situation is is appalling. I think Lord Alan Sugar actually tweeted about this earlier on this week and it was the first time I kind of became aware of this problem. He was driving through the East End where he used to live and he was shocked that he was seeing all of these piles of rubbish. And now I believe the, the council, Tower Hamlets Council, have agreed, as you mentioned before, to a, to a pay rise for the workers and the rubbish is being cleaned up. But the question is, is why do these strikes keep happening? And do the public have to be inconvenienced at this kind of level in order for things to be sorted? Or can government, whether it's local government or national government, work better with the unions and organisations in order to ensure strikes like this don't happen in the first place. Mm. Final thing, Albie, I actually watched this uh, last night on Channel 4. Bake Off was back and then it was followed uh, by celebrity SAS Who Dares Wins. And of course, who was taking part? Matt Hancock. Well, Carol Midgley's given it three stars out of five. Um, do you fancy, Albie, uh, taking a watch at, you know, Matt Hancock, former health secretary, being uh, rather run through his paces? Do you know what, Rosie? I'm shocked that you even watched it because it was a bit too late for me to watch it last <laughs> night given I had to be up so early this morning to come and speak to you. So I can't believe you managed to watch it. Maybe maybe you've got some stamina that I don't. But in terms of Matt Hancock, um, I've always been quite fascinated by him on his reality TV journey. You know, I watched him and I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. And I did vote for him um, every time to stay in the competition. Oh, did I'm you? Sure Why? I did, I did. Like because he was thought, entertaining you know, or you wanted to... I thought to... he was entertaining. I wanted to see him eat all of the different awful things. And I, I wanted to see him have a horrible, horrible time. But then when I figured out he wasn't having a horrible time, I kind of lost interest. So I think he's, he's a source of fascination to the public. And I'm sure he'll do well in Celebrity SAS. Um, and indeed in his reality TV career, which might well follow. <laughs> exactly, he seems to be doing quite well so far. There was all that concern that he was actually potentially going to win uh, and become king of the jungle. Um, I don't think you can... Can you win Celebrity SAS? Maybe someone is sort of crowned the ultimate... I don't know what happens at the end. Um, we'll find out. Albie, thank you so much. Albie Amacona, political commentator and co-founder of Conservatives Against Racism. Just